Hello everyone and welcome back and let's move ahead in the studies of study of the book of Genesis. Let's move to the ninth chapter. Let me start sharing the screen. OK, so this chapter is the ninth chapter and we will look into the family that is committed to God. OK, so by the picture, you can understand what are we going to learn mainly about. So let's try derive some kind of uh, lessons from this chapter. OK, so introductory in introductory way, we can see that the trials are very common experience to all who choose to follow God. So every, especially those people who choose to follow God, they experience more trials and more uh, tests than anybody else okay so trials can tend they tend to basically they tend to shape us they tend to make us more mellow and they cause us to reflect on truly significant things of life and they prepare us to stand in god's presence so these are the things that actually trials do those trials have a more long lasting and they have more proper and more perfect and more positive effects on us we though may though when we are going through these trials we may feel uh, a kind of shattering a kind of breaking down a kind of you know crumbling experiences but it will actually to shape us and mold us okay so we may never pass beyond the trials of faith in this life so till we are alive don't think you can get rid of any kind of trial okay so till you're alive your faith will be tested and your faith will be on trial so in this lesson basically we'll talk about isaac and ishmael there's a peace pact of at beersheba then isaac a uh, sacrifice that is Isaac given back to God. Then we have death and burial of Sarah. Then we have uh, wife of Isaac, that's about Rebecca. And then the last years of Abraham. So let's begin. Uh, so let's look into Ishmael and Isaac. So we basically find the story in chapter 21 and 25. So we can see the joy that the birth of Isaac brought to the patriarchal family and the sorrow that came by sending Ishmael away. So Abraham loved both. Abraham did not want Ishmael to go away, but with the birth of Isaac, he had to allow Ishmael to go from that place. So Isaac was given by God. Okay. So 25 years had passed since Abraham and Sarah had entered uh, Canaan, and Abraham was now 100 years old and Sarah 90. Uh, they got, God waited till they had reached the age where it was impossible for them to bear child biologically. Isaac's birth was supernatural, an act of divine grace, and the fulfillment of the promise. Laughter is associated with the baby birth, baby's birth, and he was named Laughter, that is Isaac. Isaac's birth would be a constant reminder of his, of his supernatural birth and of the covenant that God had made with him even before the birth. Okay, so uh, we see that he was, so he had a supernatural birth. Uh, it would always be a reminder to him and it was a promise given to him basically even before he was born. Uh, second that we see is Ishmael is sent to him. So with the birth of Isaac, we see Ishmael is being sent to him, which is, it was again not right. It was quite unjust, but nonetheless, it was allowed by the laws of that time. So a great feast was held to celebrate Isaac's weaning. Okay, so Isaac was becoming big and it was a time for his weaning. Weaning means he stops drinking mother's milk. Okay, and he's becoming, he can eat solid food now, little bit solid food now. Uh, that's what we see that uh, that's a weaning period. So as guests were rejoicing and speaking blessings over Isaac, we see Sarah sees something that should not have uh, happened. Okay, so she sees Ishmael was mocking Isaac. And probably this was not for the first time that she saw this thing happening. So she, as his mother, Isaac's mother, felt irritated and she thought she should do something about it. Did Ishmael do it out of envy, unbelief, or sense of superiority? Sarah was determined to end this act or this kind of behavior. Her old bitterness against Hagar stirred up and she demanded them to leave. Okay, he says she, she goes to Abraham and he says, get rid of that slave woman and her son. That slave woman's son will never share the inheritance with my son. So she did not, she could not see them equal. She could not see them as brothers. She could not see them as siblings because she was that, because Ishmael was born from her, from another woman and she did not like Hagar. Secondly, now she has her own son. Now why she would need another woman's son. So now we see this kind of behavior change in the attitude. Okay, so if you remember, uh, Sarah was a person who brought Hagar into the scene, who did injustice to her, who because of Sarah, 
Hagar becomes pregnant with Abraham's son. Ishmael is her son. And now she wants, now Sarah only, okay? Sarah only wants them to leave, which is actually we see all over and over again. It's not right. Okay, so she, uh, Hagar is basically being, it's, 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 she's a victim in the hands of Sarah. So in exchange of freedom, Ishmael had to give up his uh, claim or birthright, I would say, as an inheritance. Okay, so we see all these things are happening. So if Ishmael had to go from that place, uh, if he had to be set away, then he had to give up all his claims to the inheritance that he was Abraham's son. So Abraham was so distressed as he loved Ishmael so much, but God spoke to him once again. God said, Isaac is the covenantal son. Through him, the Redeemer is going to come. So Isaac lets him, so, so Abraham lets him go. But God had not forgotten his promise about Ishmael. Okay, he will bless him and he will make him the father of nation too because he is Abraham's son. Okay, so because Abraham's son, Ishmael also is blessed. Okay, because God saw the tears of Hagar, he is blessed. Okay, God knew that they could not dwell together in harmony and their separation would be better for both the sons. So sometimes separation is better to live in more peace and harmony okay, instead of staying together and having strife every day. So Apostle Paul uses this episode to illustrate the impossibility of peaceful coexistence of law and gospel. So he says, Paul basically, uh, so we can say that Paul basically uh, says that law and gospel is two different things. They cannot live together. They cannot stay together peacefully and harmoniously. So if gospel is there, law has to go. Just like Isaac is there, so Ishmael has to go. Okay, that's what uh, how Paul uses. So in Ishmael's persecution uh, of Isaac, Paul saw a prophetic type of legalistic of legalists of his day who were trying to make all Christians submit to the rules and regulations of Judaism in order to be saved. So as uh, uh, we can see, uh, Ishmael is law and gospel is uh, Isaac. So we can see that in, in Paul's times, what he's saying is he takes him as an example of legalists. He says, uh, these people, uh, they follow the law and instead of being free in the gospel, they follow the law and they insist that these people should follow all the laws and regulations, the feasts and the festivals and the sacrifices and everything uh, to uh, be saved. Okay, but that's not how the gospel talks. The gospel talks about having faith in Christ and being saved, not doing having to do all these uh, ritualistic acts. Okay, that's what uh, the Bible talks. So that is how Paul is using the example. So, but Paul insisted that only the sons of the promised of the promise are the heirs in the God's kingdom. Okay, only the sons of the promise are the heirs in God's kingdom. Those who depend on their works are excluded from the kingdom or the covenant. That's what uh, how Paul is using this, uh, this, 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 you know, this, the whole scenario of uh, Ishmael and Isaac. So let's see what God has to say about Ishmael. So God's care for Ishmael. Uh, if you can see this picture over here, it, it talks about uh, before his birth, uh, God uh, promises to his mother and gives a name to Ishmael that is God hears and he protects he is protected by God in his youth we can see from chapter 17 to 21 God promises to his father a promise is renewed saved from death he saved from death God heard his cries and God was with him then in his adulthood we can see he's married to an Egyptian he's a father of 12 tribes lived 137 years promises were fulfilled in his life so although Hagar and Ishmael were expelled from Abraham's household, they were not excluded from the care of God. So though they are not living in the tents of Abraham, they are always living in the tents of God. Okay, so returning to Egypt, they got, uh, uh, when they were returning to Egypt and they were sent away from the house, they were returning to Egypt, they, got, they were lost on their way in the desert of Beersheba and almost uh, were going to die because they were thirsty and they had no water to drink and they could not see any kind of river or any kind of water source around them. Out of exhaustion, they were going to die. But God stepped in and he rescued them. Both were weeping. Probably Ishmael's cry to God. Ishmael cried to God at this point and the angel of the Lord opened their eyes and they saw a water nearby. The angel also encouraged them with a renewed promise that Ishmael would become the father of a great nation. Okay? So God reminded him that God is still and is mindful of them and their needs. So in that desert, once again, God heard 
okay in that desert once again god heard and god was mindful of them god had not forgotten them and he is providing their needs once again so they had to depend on god and nobody else so god was with the boy as he grew up and was faithful to his promise to make ishmael a great nation he grew up to be an archer he was married to an egyptian and his nomadic life in the desert actually separated him from completely from abraham and his household because abraham now was settled in one place and uh, isaac uh, sorry ishmael was a nomad moving from this place to that place so he was uh, completely uh, cut off from his household so god blessed him with 12 sons and he uh, and he gave him a long life from then uh, he he have come to abraham uh, from then uh, basically from them uh, from ishmael has come the great nation of arab so ishmael's story shows us that a person or a nation may enjoy god's favor even though not given the same prominence okay so even the people who are outside god's kingdom or outside uh, the believer sect as we call it uh, are also blessed and god is with them and god shows favor to them also because he loves them and god chose isaac for a purpose but he was with ishmael too and blessed him too so god is with us for a purpose because we are his children but he loves other people too Okay, so let's move to the next part. That is the peace pact at Beersheba. This is a very small incident that takes place. If you remember Abimelech, uh, the one uh, just recently we saw about. Okay, so Abimelech wanted to maintain a friendly relation with Abraham because he has come come to know that he is, you know, firstly he is a prophet, then he is a man of reverence, he is a man of honor, and he is a wealthy man. So we can see that he is a person of honor. So Abimelech wanted to, you know, did not want to have enmity with him, understanding his power and his influence. So he wanted to have a good relationship with him. So Abraham frankly told there was an incident. What happened was uh, Abimelech's servants and Abimelech's people were actually uh, not allowing them to use some wells which belonged to Abraham. Okay, so Abraham frankly told Abimelech about the problem of the well that the king's servants had seized. They had taken away and they had seized. So Abimelech graciously corrected uh, the injustice. <laughs> well, our uh, well are essential. in the wells are essential basically we understand that importance of wells in the southern palestinian or palestinian regions or arabic arabic regions as the rains are very less and the water is scarce so this is the often uh, this often results in a lot of quarrels and you know between the herdsmen because of the wells one well and so many people are there so it becomes problematic situation the person controlling the well controlled the grazing rights in that area so whoever uh, is owner of the well or that area owns the well and uh, he controls who should drink and who should not drink from that well so the covenant between abraham and abimelech was ratified with an oath and god was their witness so abraham sacrificed cattle and sheep and with the giving of seven ewe lambs it was witnessed that the well belonged to abraham not to abimelech so from then on the well was called beer sheba the well of oath from that time onwards because the oath was taken on that Abraham planted a tamarisk tree uh, there as a landmark to show that this is the edge or the boundary line line of south of Palestine or Israel. So there is uh, there at Beersheba, uh, sorry Beersheba, we see Abraham worship the name of the Lord, the Eternal God. So he called on the name of El Olam, the Eternal God. Next, we see uh, the incident of Isaac. Okay, Isaac is given back to God. This is one of the biggest, biggest trials that we see that is happening in the life of Abraham. So this is the biggest test of faith. We all know this story, and we all know a lot of implications of it. So we'll just go through the story and learn from it, and renew our, uh, you know, renew. renew the faithful life of abraham in our minds so in genesis 22 we see the greatest trial in the life of abraham and the climax of his faith this was the last test actually which god took from abraham of abraham so abraham had a long walk of faith with god where he learned difficult lessons of his faith and this lesson taught him these you know basically these tests taught him and it shows that he had learned the best lessons very well because this this test this test the most difficult test and the response of abraham 
it was amazing okay it was it, it was not human it was amazing the way he responded to this test okay so the writer very carefully informs us that god tested abraham even before describing his trials okay so even before the author or the writer describes about his trials he talks about that god is the one who is testing abraham so testing is different from tempting we have to understand though in hindi uh, this this pariksha pariksha we use um it and the same thing tempting and uh, testing ke liye but these both have different meanings complete different meanings temptations temptations are appeals to men for the lower nature to do wrong okay so it appeals to the man's lower nature lower nature to do wrong but testing appeals to the higher nature to overcome his natural inclination to do what is right okay so we have to understand that temptation kya hai wo hamare lower nature ko appeal karta hai jahan par hum galat karte hain kar sakte hain karte hain galat karane ke liye secondly testing kya hai wo hamare higher nature ko appeal karta hai so that we can overcome all these natural inclinations aur hum sahi kar sake taki hum sahi kaam kar sake okay so god does not test us to know whether we are faithful okay so sometimes we may think that god is testing us to know whether i am faithful or not no but it is to show the strength of our faith how strong is our faith it is to build the strength in our faith to strengthen our faith that god tests us not to know whether we are faithful or not so testing is an opportunity to show our love to god so when we are tested we can show our love to god and to rise in our uh, moral standards before god okay and by overcoming all the obstacles so though being tested abraham was able to prove his supreme love for god okay to reach the summit of to reach the summit of faith to receive more profound revelations from god and his ways okay so when abraham uh when abraham went through this test he you know he proved that he loved god more than anything else okay so let's see what happens after this what is happening in the test abraham's test of faith was very severe for three reasons okay he there was a conflict in his mind for three reasons because and that is why we can say that it was a very severe test so first the first is the conflict between love for his son and the love for god okay he loved both he loved his son so much he loved his son so much because he is the only son the promised son covenantal son and he has been longing for this son for years and now that god has given him this son god wants it back okay so he loved his son so much but he loved god also okay so it was to state take your son your only son isaac whom you love he was a long awaited son so he loved his son so much and he even loved the lord so there was a conflict between the love for the son and love for god he could not understand probably what to choose from that second thing is a seeming conflict between god's goodness and his demand so we can see that there is a conflict between god's goodness like goodness of god so he he does not understand how you know this good god can demand such an evil thing because we know that a commonly god does not like when we sacrifice our children molek ko uh, they were sacrificing their children later on and god was against it and we see even before also a god never is for when the children had to have to be sacrificed unto gods and goddesses so this was against his ethical and moral nature of god okay the religious nature of god so how could this goodness of god stand in conflict with the demand of what god is asking right now okay god wanted to check whether he will give back to god the most precious thing that he had given to him okay god was just checking if abraham loves him so much that he is ready to give him the most precious thing of his life okay so redeemed by the death of substitute they were to live for god so after this they were always to live for god okay so next is we can see the conflict between god's promise and isaac's death this both was in conflict god promised to give a son and from him the descendants will be born and this conflict stood where god is asking to kill him and sacrifice him so the command was painful as it was it would annul the covenant made by god okay it will it will crush or it will break the covenant made by god so god is breaking his own covenant here in the midst of shattering hopes the patriarch still obeys no explanation was given to the anguished patriarch why 
God is doing, asking him to do this. Faith was never tested so severely, nor did it ever shine more brilliantly ever before. Okay, next thing that we see here is the obedience of faith. Chapter 22, verses 3 to 14. So Abraham, what does Abraham do when God commands him to do this? He gets up early in the morning, made preparations for the journey, and left with his son and his two servants. There was no questions. He asked God. There were no excuses. He gave to God, and there was not a minute of delay. Abraham's obedience was unconditional. He did not ask why God. It was unconditional. Many times we just keep asking God, why God, why me, why God, why God? Okay, But here we see Abraham's obedience was unconditional. He did not ask even a question. Okay, he, It was prompt. It was unconditional. It was prompt. It was absolute. Okay, There was no conditions applied to his obedience. It was quick, immediate, and it was complete. So these things are very important. Unconditional, prompt, and absolute obedience. It was Active acceptance of God's command. He quickly accepted, though it was painful, he immediately accepted God's command. As Abraham advanced to Mount Moriah with many thoughts running through his mind, but not a word uttering from his mouth, he told his servants to stop at the foot of the mountain. He told them, stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go over there. With a short faith, he added, we will worship and then we will come back to you. So he was very much confirmed that this God is a true God. This God made a covenant with me and he is never going to break the covenant. God may do whatever he wants to do, but my son is going to come back with me because it has been given to me by my God through a cut covenant. A cut covenant, the highest form of covenant. And God does not break his promises. So probably in his mind, he trusted in the character of God, believing that God will keep his every word if he has to raise Isaac from the dead, be it. Okay, So he believes that even if Isaac is sacrificed on the altar, God is going to raise his dead son back to life. And he's going to walk back down the mountain with his alive son. So is Isaac carrying the wood? asks his father. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burning burnt offering? Abraham responded with composure, very calm, very composed. He maybe there was, you know, many questions running in his mind, but he never showed that that was the kind of person he was, everything was within. He was very calm and composed outside. Okay, so he very composed manner may he responds, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Very simple answer. God will provide. Okay. So little, little did he know that he had uttered a profound prophetic truth. He did not know that God is going to provide a offering. Probably trusted the nature of God and he would have understood God by now. Okay. That's what we can understand. He said a prophetic word and that is what was going to happen very soon on the Mount Moriah. Moriah is a prophetic picture of Calvary where Isaac, like Jesus, in obedience carried the wood or cross for his own sacrifice. Isaac's age is not mentioned, but he may have been in his teens. So according to your book, okay, according to your book, it says it may he may have been in his teens. Okay. But if you study more, if you try to, you know, uh, get through and dig in more, you will realize and you will, and if you try to calculate the ages and everything um, of his mother and when he was born and when his mother died. Okay. Uh, soon after this, his mother is going to die. Okay. So we have to understand that probably, probably he was not in his teens. He was in his 30s. 30 to 33 ke beech mein tha wo. Lagbhag 33. That is why he is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. Okay. So, my, yase, Moraya, jo hai wo, it is the type of uh, picture of Calvary. In the same way Jesus, uh, Isaac is a picture of Jesus. So, we have to understand that age should also be similar. Okay. So, he was probably not in his teens, but he was in his 30s. So, probably around 30 to 33 years ka tha. Isaac, he was not less. Okay, So if you calculate the ages properly and uh, he could have escaped easily. He was a big man. He could have esca escaped easily. Uh, we have to also understand that a teen aged boy cannot carry wood like this. Uh, so much wood on his shoulder, on his head while climbing the mountains. So it has to be a well-built man okay, who, uh, who could carry uh, the wood all through from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. So rather, uh, we can say that he could have escaped, okay, but he allowed his father to bind him 
on the altar he was obedient to his father extremely obedient to his father okay so that was some characteristic that isaac had a very passive characteristic where he never used to rebel where he never used to you know put forward, put forward his own emotions or anything he was very silent submissive and obedient man accepting all commands of his father without murmuring so that was the character of isaac very submissive and very laid back i would say he trusted his father and he yielded himself to god's will okay so he trusted his father completely that his father will not let anything happen to him because he loved him a lot and he yielded himself to god's will seeing the faithfulness of god he has yielded himself to god so let us look at some of the similarities between isaac and Jesus. So you can go through to these references and see that. So he was promised by God. He was long awaited, supernatural birth, loved by the father, mocked by brothers, sacrifice of father, obedient to death, sacrifice at Moriah, carried the word, divine intervention, saved from death, raised from death, covenant with God, heir of rich father. I guess you can just go through these references. It will help in expansion of your understanding. Okay, so let's see what happens there up on the hill. So uh, there was a reward of faith. Okay, thirdly, we see the reward of faith. So faith in God is always rewarded. There must be a trial so that we may we may live by faith and not by sight. So when only when there is a trial, our faith comes into application. If there is no trial, we just start living a very you know simple life without faith, without using faith. If there is something exciting like trials come into our life, then we start living by faith and not only by sight, and we receive the reward for it. Okay. Uh, next thing that we see over here is uh, from this reward is uh, reward of faith. We see in this that the faith is strengthened. Okay. The faith is strengthened. Abraham saw the resurrection power of faith because he believed. Okay. so he saw the resurrection power of god because he believed if he had not believed he wouldn't have seen the resurrection power of god so as he wrestled with a lot of questions within a thought probably illumined his mind okay a thought probably illumined his mind and abraham reasoned that god could raise that dead so he then might think would be going on in his mind that maybe god will not accept the sacrifice maybe god will let him go maybe this maybe that so this first time this thought is seen in the bible that the resurrection about resurrection that god will raise a dead god will raise a dead this is the first time we are listening to this kind of thought in the bible so the belief that god would raise a dead was unknown in those days sometimes we may face such situations only to find Christ, the resurrection of life, and beyond that. Okay, so we may face some so difficult, deadening situations that the only thing that we learn from there or get from there is Christ, and we see His resurrective resurrection power, and we see life beyond that situation. Okay, fiery trials can purify us if we go through it, trusting God. But we have to go through it. We don't have to stop. We have to go through it. Only then we can be purified. second thing that we see is god's approval abraham's obedience was now approved by god okay without actually sacrificing his son though his faith was tried up to the final moment so he has almost sacrificed his son in his mind you have to understand that okay so god has now approved his obedience he has accepted yes yes this is my obedient servant okay that is what god would have felt that time wow such an obedient servant okay he would have taken pleasure in the obedience of abraham okay so without actually sacrificing his son in his thought he had already sacrificed he has already faced the death of his son okay so abraham was about to plunge the knife into isaac's heart god stopped him in spirit he was already he had already sacrificed his son so mind mein to maar chuka hai mind mein to khatam kar diya usne isaac ko finished my son is gone so he has already finished his son or sacrificed his son in his mind not physically so we have to understand first it works here then it works physically okay so that's what the same thing that was happening over here he has already killed isaac in his mind now it was just a physical act okay so in spirit he had already sacrificed him god said now i know that you fear me because you have not withheld from me your son your only son 
Okay. Next thing that we see over here is a sacrifice is returned. So God may return our sacrifices today or in the future or replace it by something better. Okay. So God may ask you to sacrifice something. Okay. So he may maybe return it to you later on or return it to you at that very moment as Isaac was returned or he may even replace it with something better. Okay, so Abraham's paternal love was purified and now his son was more dear to him than ever before. So God may ask us many times, you know, to, uh, to make some kinds of sacrifices like a business, career for him, or we may even find more satisfaction. And we may even find more satisfaction in leaving all those things behind and following him and serving God. Okay, uh, though we may face some physical struggles and materialistic struggles, but still we may find satisfaction in obeying and following him. So he first wants us to give ourselves to him, then our other sacrifices. So if you, even if you sacrifice and your heart is not near God, it's not, it's not, it's not pleasing to God. The first thing that he wants is to give ourselves to God. He wants me first, then my offering. So first give yourself to God and then offer sacrifices to God. He's not interested in your sacrifices. He's interested in you. Okay. So first give yourself to God, then your sacrifices matter. But if you sacrifice and not give yourself to God, the sacrifices make no difference. Okay. So the fourth thing that we see here is knowing God better. So Abraham learned three things about God. God is interested in the inner attitude, not the outer acts. So God is not interested in what I do from outside, but he is more interested in my inner attitude, what I think, how I think, what I am from within. That is more important from, for God. So God himself supplies what he demands. The second thing that he learned is God himself supplies what he has demanded. So God asked him to sacrifice and he provided the sacrifice also. Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. Yehovah Yireh. Okay. The third thing he learned is the power of resurrection and fellowship of sharing his suffering. So we see that this is the first time he experiences, experiences the resurrection are the power of resurrection and the fellowship of sharing uh, in the suffering of God. Okay, uh, so next thing that we see, the fifth thing that we see over here is promise and guidance given. Okay, so the covenant promise were renewed and guidance given to Abraham's future course of action. So he was told what he has to do next, how he has to live. Okay, so here God added that Abraham's descendants would triumph over their enemies. So never before it was told, but now again, God adds to it that his descendants would triumph over their enemies. Okay. The promise would be fulfilled because Abraham's obedience. So this promise was being fulfilled because Abraham was obedient. So the more Abraham became obedient, the more uh, fulfillment of the promises took place. So all his blessings were gifts from God's grace. Okay, The one blessing that Abraham had was uh, the gracious gift of God. But in obedience, it enabled him to receive the blessings from that God. So blessings God had already given him. Uh, he had called it, God had already given him blessings uh, out of grace. But we also see that in obedience, he was able to receive those experience. Those uh, he was able to receive the blessings of God. Okay. Then uh, we see uh, the next uh, next topic that we are seeing over here is the death and burial of Sarah. Okay, death and burial of Sarah. Okay, so Abraham was 137 years old and Isaac was 37 years old when Sarah uh, died at the age of 127. She is the only woman whose age at death is recorded in the Bible. She was an obedient, uh, she was an obedient, worthy partner of Abraham, a co-heir of divine promise. Okay. So Peter honors her as an example of inner beauty, respect, and obedience. Probably Abraham was the uh, Abraham was away when she died. Okay, problem. Probably Abraham was away when she died. Okay, prob uh, okay. Probably we can see that Abraham was not there when she died. 